Well, hello and welcome back to Microbellum Live. We are broadcasting to you today from Southern Oregon, headquarters of Microbellum Software. We're glad that you took the time out of your day to join in on our conversation. This week, we are going to be talking about quite a few different topics in our live Q&A session that we've uh, lined up for you. And here to help present and answer some of your questions, we've invited some of our uh, developers from our, our team. And so first, we're going to hear from Lenny Siena. Lenny, thanks for joining us. Uh, he's going to be talking with us about the new Grass hardware uh, available in our latest product library release. Hello, hello. Glad to be here. And we've also invited David Daub to help uh, with Lenny as he talks about the Grass hardware. David Daub is from Grass America, and he's here to help uh, answer your specific questions on their hardware, as well as help you understand some of the differences between their product lines as Lenny goes through his pre presentation. So thanks for joining us, David. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. We're excited to contribute to this live webinar. Right. Uh, we're also going to be hearing from Shane uh, from our product quality team as he dives into a familiar topic, but one that we've been asked to cover again, and that is uh, a dive into our 2D part editor interface. So thanks for being here, Shane. We're also going to be uh, looking a little bit more into our event logging and activity tracking features, uh, tools to help you stay informed of when changes are made within your system. Uh, and here to help cover that topic is Andrew Peel. Thanks for joining us today. Yep, of course. And finally, closing out the session today, we're going to have Dominic Flores, uh, the leader of our development team, and he's going to be talking about some new functionality for our CNC auto labeling connectivity. Uh, Dominic, thanks for being here. Hey, glad to be here. Looking forward to showing you guys some of our cool new stuff. Awesome. So make sure you stay till the end. There's going to be some nice new features to review uh, once we get into that. So before we get started, though, let's just review how today's episode is going to work. Um, we are going to be covering a lot of information, move in a pretty fast pace. Uh, so your mics have been muted. It's not that we don't want to hear from you. We actually do. Uh, just be sure to use that Q&A, uh, the question and answer tool. Uh, to log all of those questions. We have a number of techs helping out behind the scenes today, so keep those questions flowing and uh, we are here to help. We also have a chat feature that many of you have probably found already. Uh, give us a shout out where you're listening in from, that'd be nice for the community to see that. We also use that for running commentary throughout the episode, but we do encourage you to use the official Q&A panel to keep those questions organized. That just helps our team understand which ones are coming in and respond in a, in a timely manner for that. So whether you are joining us on our Zoom webinar here or on our YouTube live stream right now, remember to ask a question at any time, don't hold back, and we may even answer or highlight the answer to that question live for you. All right, with that out of the way, let's get right into it. And we're gonna turn things over to Lenny, and we are going to have a close look at what Lenny's been up to in the library development team has been up to regarding the new grass hardware. Thank you so much, Clay, uh, for the opportunity to uh, uh, share, you know, uh, kind of show off the uh, what the library data can do. And I always love to share ways that you can use library data to uh, streamline your day-to-day -day processes. And also, again, I, I, I too want to thank uh, Grass, um, uh, David and Evelyn there from Grass. They're joining us here to help us out, help participate in this. Uh, since we're reviewing a lot of you know their hardware and and they're also here you know, like Clay said to any questions that you may have as we're going along so yeah use that Q&A feature uh, so as most of you know I've been giving this some thought you know hardware obviously it's a pretty big deal uh, when it comes to manufacturing cabinets and other uh, things in our industry so you know having that accurate hardware reports and accurate uh, hardware machining is obviously very uh, very critical for us cut listers and detailers uh, who are responsible for those things. Um, the cabinet libraries uh, that Microvellum makes available, you know, they all kind of come with a, a good sampling of various hardware from a whole variety of different vendors. And so as much as we'd like to include every vendor out there, it's just not possible. <laughs> uh, you know, not only would it be overwhelming to for you to sort through all those options, it would be kind of a never-ending project to just keeping it all updated and current. And on top of that, you know, the hardware availability can change even from up in Canada, our friends up north or different countries, it can all vary. So the intent really is for you to populate the data uh, with your own hardware, you know, how you want it. But 
that being said, uh, we do feel like uh, it is important to have kind of a good working example of, uh, you know, to help demonstrate how the hardware structure is kind of intended to operate. So earlier this year, we did team up with Grass America and they helped us with this development project and kind of provided many of the many things like the 3D and, and, and 2D uh, CAD data that you kind of see here, all of these AutoCAD blocks to make the hardware look, you know, very awesome. <laughs> a lot of eye candy for the cabinets. Uh, so we're looking at here at a, at a Z box, a grass Z box drawer system. Uh, so besides the look, you know, they also help us, these blocks help us with verifying the alignment. You know, if you look, take a look here, here's your hole for your cabinet side. I can make sure that uh, if I go to like a left-hand view here, all of my hardware, I can verify that the holes are lining up. And also there's, uh, if I go like to a front view, uh, I can see like the groove in my uh, drawer box bottom here is aligning with the hardware. So, uh, you know, it, it actually uh, kind of helps with that kind of stuff. But kind of side note, technically, funny thing is you don't even really need the blocks. Uh, sometimes people make the assumption that, you know, the hardware is coming or the machining is actually somehow coming from the blocks. And actually it's, that's not the case. I can remove these blocks uh, right out of my system and, uh, you know, you'll, you'll still get the hardware, the machining will still show up on the reports and, and, and so on. Anyway, so from here, we're going to review, yeah, some, some grass drawer systems, and then I've got some new slides, and then I've got some new hinges and base plates, and we'll kind of show how that's woven into the product here. Um, this Z-Box, you know, we added this in version 49.0 uh, of the library when it first came out, but with today's version, which is 49.1, we added several more drawer systems from grass. Uh, so everything that we're showing you today is available. In that version, later on, I'll show you the download uh, download location. Um, so Mr. Z-Box here, it's just kind of popular. A lot of people like this because it kind of combines the best of the two worlds. You know, it's a metal drawer, so you can build the darn thing in like two minutes. It's really quick to build, but it also has the ball bearing slides, which a lot of people uh, are looking for. Um, and so, yeah, so we've got the Z-Box, we've got the Zargon, the Integra, and the Vinero. I actually have a little thing here. You can see the differences. Uh, and maybe that's where I can, um, yeah, so here's the Zargon, uh, and then the Vinero. Uh, and this is where maybe David can help us out. Like, what are the, uh, what sets each one of these apart, David? Like, why would you want to use one over the other? Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Lenny. I'll take it from here. So uh, starting off with the Z-Box, um, I would say it's, it's kind of an evol evolutionary product from Grass um, because it blends two familiar systems, as you said. Um, blends two, two familiar systems into one. So it uses the proven Zargon system, um, which is a single wall uh, metal drawer box. Um, uh, simply put, it's for quick drawer box assembly, typically used in commercial or institutional applications and it's grade one certified product so that's um, that's a big aspect of it so that's for quick assembly um, and durable use in commercial or institutional uh, type applications uh, the second element to it is as you said um, we attached ball bearing slides to the familiar Zargon system and uh, the the key there is that they are 100 pound full extension ball bearing slides so the cabinet maker uh, not only significantly reduces labor costs by using the the Zargon system um, but also meeting the specification of a hundred pound uh, ball bearing slide full extension um, that's kind of tough to get around in most um, commercial and institutional st uh, style applications. So you get quick assembly, less uh, labor cost, and you meet a specification, a common specification with Z-Box. So this one here is basically the same thing just without the yeah the, so the ball bearing slides. The, that's exactly right, Lenny. So the, the Zargon system has been around for, gosh, 30 years. And, and so it's a tried and true system, but it runs on high grade nylon rollers. Um, and so the cabinet members and uh, drawer members are, are, are separate. Um, and so with the, so, so the Z-Box, all we're doing is taking away 
that one element of the cabinet member in it and, and instead of that attaching it to a to a you know standard ball bearing slide so that's really that's really the only difference there's a lot of commonalities between the two systems um, and so uh, they're, they're both used for commercial um, and institutional type applications. However, with Zargon, we actually sell a fair amount into uh, residential uh, type uh, type applications as well. Within the past three years, it's actually picked up quite a bit and, uh, for, for residential uh, applications uh, cool. using Zargon. And we make both of these systems in the United States here in Kernersville, North Carolina, which is where our, our U.S. headquarters is for grass. Nice. Cool. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks. And the last one was the Vinero. Yeah. We did talk yeah. about that one. This is the little bit more going on here with this guy. It is. So yeah, Vinero, we, we pronounce it Vinero. Sorry, um, I butchered that. That's okay. You, you, we, we discussed this before. Some of these are, you know, more, more branding and marketing type names, but we do pronounce it as Vinero. Hmm. And Vinero is, uh, is I guess I could say this is an evo evolutionary type of product too. It's used exclusively with our Dynapro undermount drawer system. So the Dynapro has a lot of key features and benefits. Uh, just to name a few, it's a hundred pound rated. We have a heavy duty version as well that takes it well over a hundred pounds. Um, it's, uh, it runs on a rack and pinion synchronization uh, type of uh, technology that's hidden within um, within the full extension members of the of the slide, so fully concealed, soft close, of course. Um, this is this is great for used uh, used in uh, wide and heavy drawers. Great for pots and pan drawers, and so that's the Dynapro. Um, what what sits on top of that is the Vianaro system, and so it's also um, it's also a metal drawer side system. So the cabinet maker would still be making and cutting the back, bottom, and then of course their drawer front. And then it would sit on the Dynapro undermount um, slide platform. And then you have functionality meeting aesthetics with the VNRO system. So the VNRO system is the two metal drawer slides. They're a half inch uh, profile. Uh, they come with pre-mounted bracketry for easy assembly. So a lot, of the, a lot of the same concepts that's used with the Zargon system is actually used with VNRO. It's just more of a contemporary European type of design that can be used with both uh, European frameless cabinetry and face frame cabinetry. Um, and we sell the Vianaro system uh, in three different colors, a silver, graphite, and white. And we have uh, various different heights, I believe five different, five different heights. Um, uh, and and, and uh, the, the standard lengths as well, um, you know, 15 inch through, uh, through 21 inch. Cool. And so, uh, and so what I mean by that from the aesthetics and functionality is that you have these design elements with the different colors and different heights, um, but you also get um, uh, functionality out of it because it is, it does make up the structural integrity of the drawer box itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have the metal sides, the half inch drawer profiles that sit on the Dynapro slide. So it's a nice combination um, that are used exclusively together. Nice. Well, thanks, David. Yeah, that helps us differentiate. Here's where I was going to show where you can pick those. You can choose them in each individual cabinet in the microfilm library. We have a tab just for the drawer boxes. And so you can choose between the different um, drawer systems. Okay. And I'll also at a project level, if you go to your project setup, um, usually there's a wizard here where you set up your job and you can go to hardware, select drawers. And here's where, you know, you can change it across the whole project uh, as, as well. So, uh, let's see, check my notes here. Lenny, sorry to interrupt. This no, is David, okay. David from Grass again. Uh, one, one thing I didn't mention on the, the Diana Pro slash Vianaro uh, mm -hmm. combination is that um, you have a lot of adjustability. Um, so you have side to side adjustment, you have height adjustment, tilt adjustment and even depth adjustment if you want. So mm. whether you use the VNRO system um, as a complement or, you know, if you're already using the Dynapro undermount system, regardless of whether you choose to use, you know, the design element of the VNRO that sits on top um, as your drawer box uh, uh, choice, you have full adjustability and it's great for inset drawers as well with that side to side. Yes. I was going to, in a little bit here, I've got a note for myself to remind myself to show that. Uh, basically, it's like a rollout above the drawer box. So, yeah, I was going to definitely show that off uh, in a little bit. Okay, so great. Look, 
looking at this side view here, if you're familiar with how these drawers systems work in Microvillain, they typically, you know, like you said, come with the different available heights. So we've built into the spreadsheet logic kind of a way to have each drawer it automatically will select the appropriate height and depth based on, you know, certain criteria like how much available space do you want behind each drawer or above each drawer. Uh, so it's pretty automated as long as you set up those variables to how you want them, the, the correct drawer or hardware, it'll just automatically appear. Um, and speaking of variables, maybe I'll go into the global variable and show you how what we have going on here. Uh, you go to drawers and rollouts, uh, go to system settings, go to, in this case, we're talking about grass drawer systems. So here each system has its own kind of category. So like, you know, uh, for the Z box, here's the different available heights. Uh, so like if for some reason you only want this little, the 85 and the 213, you can just uncheck that and that tells the system you don't want, you know, to use that hive and the calculations will work. And then here's, you know, what material do you want uh, for the back and for the side, do you want to use a 19 mil, 16 or 12? So each one has that. What else do we have here? Do you want to, you know, drill those holes in the back? How do you want to handle that groove? Do you want to route it? Uh, do you want to saw? Do you just want to do it offline? Uh, the fixing bracket, you have different, you know, you want like a wood screw or as you can see here, all the different options. So a lot of things to set up, which will help make, uh, you know, help you with them details. Um, also, so that's kind of globally, right? It's gonna, your, uh, your whole job that's using that global will follow those, but also each individual product, you know, you can, uh, if I go to my, there's cabinet prompts, we also have sub-assembly prompts. I'm gonna prompt this one individual drawer here, right? And you can change the grain direction of the material. Uh, you can go here, you can turn off the rails. You can force the height to be a different height. Uh, you know, all those, a lot of those same variables are also right here. They don't have time to go through them all, but kind of get the, get the gist of it. Uh, yeah, let's go to that fine arrow here. So here, this is a fine arrow. Um, the rollout. So like right now, there's not enough space up here to fit a rollout. And so what you can do, I'm gonna prompt this. Let's make some space. So right now I have a 249. So I bump it down to 185 height. And then all of a sudden this other checkbox appears uh, that says show rollouts. Okay, well here they are, rollouts. And so I say, oh, I want one rollout. And okay, so I hit okay. It's gonna redraw this cabinet and it'll add that. You'll see this slide get smaller and it adds that a rollout behind the drawer. So it's kind of a, I don't wanna say a subtle feature, but it isn't necessarily obvious that it can do that. But it, uh, if you play around with them, those variables, you'll see that it is possible. One of the things that I hope you're noticing during all this demonstration is we didn't just vacuum in a bunch of static hardware, you know, we actually, integrated the hardware in here to function kind of dynamically as a product, even affecting how the cabinets behave. So that's why I think Microvellum is so powerful. And to me, I think it sets it apart from anything else because the level of automation that you can achieve, it's really quite enormous. It's I kind of get, kind of get, it's addicting when I really get, get into the library development part of it. I, you know, there's so much you can do. Um, so looking at the time, it's like I better hurry a little bit here. So if we move on, let's move on to uh, the drawer slides. I'll just touch on this real briefly. These are obviously use a, a regular drawer box, right? Opposed to a metal drawer system. Uh, what do we got here? And they also even have 2D blocks as well as the 3D, the Dynapro, um, and then the Elite and Maxis, these are all undermounts. Uh, so again, if you want to prompt this cabinet, because I've selected instead of a drawer system, I've selected a wood box. Now you pick, all right, well, which slide do you want? 
And I was hoping David could help me understand, I was kind of wondering myself, the difference between these four Dynapros. There's a Tipmatic, Heavy Duty. Sure. Yeah, so, <clears throat> um, so yeah, the, the Dynapro, which I kind of already covered, talking about the Vianaro, since the two are, are used together. Yeah. Um, so speaking of, of, of only, the, whenever I speak of Dynapro, Anytime I say Dynapro, you can also use the VNRO system on it instead of a traditional wood drawer box, like a dovetail wood drawer box, for example. You could change that up and use the VNRO system instead of all wood construction. So just to just yeah. to get that um, clear. So with with the Dynapro, whether you're using a, a, drawer, a wooden drawer box or the VNRO, you have the option of um, either a standard soft close. So all the Dynapro comes standard with uh, with a soft close. Um, uh, version, but we also have what we call a Tipmatic soft close. So in the past, te uh, Tipmatic, which is the term we um, we use, again, it's, it's our name for a, a touch latch or a push to open system. So this is great for handle-free applications, or uh, we typically see it in trash bin uh, sets, actually. So where you don't you don't want to have to use your hands. Your your hands are uh, you know, you have, you have the garbage there, the garbage bag, so you give it a hip or give it a knee, and you push to open the drawer. So that's what Tipmatic means. Mm -hmm. So with Dynapro uh, and, and other, you know, e even competitors in the past, um, your touch latch system was all mechanical. And so, which means you push to open, but then you have to manually close it and re-engage that spring. It's spring-loaded uh, or, or mechanical. So what we've come up with um, uh, pretty recently, it's been on the market for a little over a year now, is the Tipmatic with soft close on the Dynapro uh, platform, the Dynapro undermount platform. So this gives you not only the push to, ocean, push to open uh, touch latch function, but now you can actually close the drawer and you have soft close. You don't have to manually re-engage that yeah. screen. So you don't lose your soft close. And soft close is become almost a standard in any type of cabinetry, whether it's high-end custom or, you know, semi-stock cabinetry. So the cabinet maker now has an upgrade option that has a, um, a push to open Tipmatic feature, but now the, the consumer doesn't lose their soft close whenever they close the drawer back. It closes nice, silently, and smoothly, and they don't have to, to manually re-engage that, uh, that mechanical operation. Cool. Thanks, David. And yeah. uh, I was going to so the, in here is where you can control the different depths, well, where the holes go in a table. That's kind of how it works with microvellum. You've got your different depths that are available, and then where the first hole, second hole, third hole, et cetera, goes. I don't know, just something that's for, there's some people on the call today that uh, maybe aren't familiar with how microvellum works, and it's driven, these products are driven from a spreadsheet, including these spreadsheet tables. Um, speaking of our audience today, I, we do have a question. I was trying to decide if I could answer this, but maybe you could help, David. The question says, any chance uh, the height of the Z-Box will be available to, to match the heights of the standard Zarkin guides? Uh, he says he likes the full extension option on the metal sides, and it beats the building wood boxes. I guess he's implying there that they're different. Yeah, so the Zargon system is more expansive than the Z-Box system. We went with the, uh, the, the highest volume and, and, and the, the most common uh, height applications. Uh, so we do have, I guess, starting with really, and of course, all of this information is, is available online at grassusa.com. Um, you can download all of the full catalogs that have all this information. But just, yeah. just going through the catalog here in front of me, we have the, the 213 uh, millimeter version, which is eight and three eighths. <clears throat> um, that's the tallest. Um, a size down is the 149 millimeter, which is five and seven eighths um, height. And then the 85 millimeter, which is three and three eighths inch mm -hmm. height. Um, so those are, and of course there are various railing systems that you can, you can use with that. Um, uh, however, mm -hmm. those, are the, those are the common heights. Um, and that does match the, the existing Zargon uh, uh, program. It's just not quite mm -hmm. as expensive. I believe we have a couple other heights available in the, in the Zargon program versus yeah. the program. But we did, we did try to, uh, to get the, the, you know, the primary main uh, volume um, heights. Nice. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, well, luckily, you know, because it's all spreadsheet based, you can get in here and kind of fudge it if you had to. Right. to get it to do whatever uh, you want. I was going to show there's a little notch here. 
see if I remove that. Yeah, so here's the bottom of the drawer or the back and it's showing the little notch for the, to accept this undermount slide. And it's all parametric. So as the your thickness of your drawer side changes, it'll accommodate appropriately. So it's all parametric. All right, well, looking at the clock, we are running out of time. So I'm gonna move on to hinges and base plates real quick. Uh, save some time for our other presenters. Uh, so we have a large portion of the grass. Uh, I'm gonna butcher this. Timos. <laughs> T. T. Timos. Ah, I messed yeah, we, it up. We yeah. say Tiamos. Tiamos. That's right. You told me, and I already forgot. Sorry. I'm, yeah, that's okay. Uh, yeah. So here, here it is. Here, pretty looking hinge, uh, and we also included the institutional version as well, which is cool. Um, if you've never studied a technical document on cabinet hinges, it's you wouldn't believe how much goes into what would seem like just a simple little hinge. Uh, there's just a lot of choices when you're make, when you're selecting the appropriate hinge for whatever your particular situation is. You know we've got all the different angles and uh, the different uh, dowel patterns and uh, you know the reveals inset overlay, which is going to be uh, you know your uh, your gosh yeah it's so we we've automated quite a bit of this for you. Uh, so if you go into your, oh, let's take a look at, here it is in 3D, you can see our, our hinge, which is associating to the door, giving us the machining, and a base plate, which is associating to our cabinet side, giving us the, the five millimeter holes there. But also in the global, if you go to hinges, so there's two systems inside a microfilm library. There's a whole hinge system for face frame and a whole uh, and a whole system for frameless, which is what we're focusing on right now. So here's where you can pick like, do you want, you know, a straight or a wing plate? Uh, do you want uh, your, uh, you know, hinge spacing? Where do your hinges start? Uh, how, how often, uh, you know, do you want to do a pocket route or do you want to drill <clears throat> for your cup hole? What's the diameter? Uh, but specifically, if we get into this new, so here's some new variables here in the version 49. What is the dowel type that you want? And, th and this information is pulled right out of that technical document that I was just showing you. Uh, and so what you choose here, you can even do the finish here. What you choose in here will update your hardware report. It'll even pull in different um, blocks, AutoCAD blocks that look a little slightly different. Uh, yeah, so here's you want expanding dowel. So you do need to be a little careful here. Um, there are some, like 100, there's 160 degrees, 110 degrees. I can't remember. Let's look at the different degrees. If you go to hardware, hinges, here it is. So here's where you would pick your, your hinge, and then here's where you would pick the four different degrees. And some availab availability can vary depending on which degree. So you do need to check and make sure that what you're picking is actually, you know, available in this document. But nevertheless, uh, there you go. So there's that. And so it's automatic. You know, like if I change this cabinet to be an inset door, um, you'll see that the hardware will change to an, a different type of hinge to accommodate that uh, particular condition. And same with, oh, I gotta show you this. Uh, if you pick a institutional, and then I redraw this cabinet. Institutional is some different machining, you know, instead of a, the, the 35 millimeter cup hole actually, uh, you know, is half off the panel like that. So that's all working nicely. Some good blocks for that. Um, okay, I, I, and then our reports, I made a, a report here <clears throat> so that just to save some time, uh, it's called just a hardware report and you'll see <clears throat> all these products that I've shown you today, I went ahead and processed them and, and you can see like, here's the name that's all coming out uh, with the different uh, <clears throat> 
hardware items. Um, how am I doing on time, Clay? Am I, how far? I know I'm over. Yeah, I think we're okay. Uh, we may go a little uh, long today, so. Uh, okay, because I wanted to show them this report and I wanted to show them the download location sure. next here. That might conclude my, yep. uh, uh, let's close this here. So to download the new library, and we'll get into on our help center here, if you have, uh, if you're on Microvellum's uh, support plan, you have access to all kinds of goodies here, like knowledge base articles, videos. Um, I, I did a lot of videos in this one here for all the library data. Get a plug in for that. <laughs> but so you go to downloads, uh, component cabinet library. So you click that, and there's a page where we keep updated. So here's the version 49 uh, that you can download. And then clicking this will send you over to the <clears throat> release notes. So uh, the most common question, you know, I get whenever I demonstrate something new is like, okay, Lenny, that's great. You know, but how do I get all this new stuff, you know, in my library? Do I really have to start over? Um, you know, and the answer is it really depends on your particular situation uh, and what your own company's kind of philosophy is regarding your library. You know, some companies that use microfilm, they'll only modify those global variables. So whatever the library can do out of the box, you know, that's, that's what they do. And so it makes updating a new library really kind of a piece of cake. Uh, not something you'd want to do, you know, every month, but maybe every year or two, you know, it's not that big of a deal to just update your globals to the new version. So, um, the other scenario is kind of where it maybe gets a little more complicated for people is, you know, you, maybe you've taken the liberty of made a lot of heavy modifications to your library and all your products. And so there's nothing wrong with that approach. You know, that's what makes microvellum so great is that it, you can customize things. But um, for those scenarios, you know, keeping your library as is and sort of blending in this new hardware is probably a better approach. And we actually have some tools that help with that. Uh, to a to, to limited extent uh, in your database, you know, you can uh, import and export certain materials and subassemblies that you can bring in. Uh, you do need to be careful before doing that. And this is why I advise having a conversation with your uh, account manager. That's that they're there for is to, uh, uh, it's, that's a big decision to update a library like that. And so they'll kind of look at your situation and give you some advice on what to do there. I also have lots of training videos that teach you about basic library development. And anyway, so um, looking at the questions, is there any questions that I miss, Clay, or maybe I need to copy? Yeah, not that I saw. Um, I think uh, you did a good job and covered quite a bit of information here. It looks like about 25 minutes or so of information. Okay. So yeah, I think it was good. And if there's any other questions related to what Lenny and uh, David has been helping us with, remember that they are still here and they can answer your questions in the chat or in the Q and A, I should say. Um, so yeah, Lenny, I think that's a lot of good information. Great, yeah, thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you once again to David and Evelyn from Grass uh, for being here today. It's always nice having an opportunity to spotlight uh, industry partners on these events. And as David mentioned, you can also learn more about their product lines at grassusa.com. Absolutely. Uh, Clay, thank you from, from, uh, from Grass, on behalf of Grass, uh, David and Evelyn here, we, we thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we're, we're excited about this and hopefully we can we contribute it in a good way. Definitely. And we'll, uh, we'll be sticking around to answer questions too. I saw uh, a couple uh, a couple other Zbox questions. So ask away, we're, we are here to answer your questions. Awesome, appreciate that. Thanks, David. Thank you. All right, so next we are going to talk about things. We're gonna be talking about the 2D part editing controls. And here to help us with that is uh, Shane. This is, uh, as I mentioned before, a popular topic. Um, a lot of uh, users that we talk to like hearing more news about this uh, this feature and so here to help us with that is Shane so uh, welcome Shane hello happy to be here so yeah we're going to be showing uh, the 2d machining tools today it, it's uh, it's been in the release for a while um, but there has been a few questions come in 
about it. Um, some of the things, the aspects of it are a little different. People are kind of questioning. And so we just kind of review it one more time and kind of show us some of the, the new tools that are available in it and how the best way to use it. So again, um, to access the 2D machining tools is uh, just via this button right here uh, on the toolbox side and then it comes in and you can dock it, whatever you want. Now, the first thing to watch for when you do this and the first and the thing that gets overlooked the most is this very top spot right here. And this is the current processing station and current work order. The current work order is pretty good uh, because most of the time you're gonna have your processing center open because you have just made the nest and then you immediately open up the nest and okay, I need to, address it, I need to move some parts around, add some routes, whatever, and then you open up this. So it knows that you have that work order loaded and it will load that in. It is good to watch that though, because if you don't have the processing center loaded, um, it will come in blank. It won't have one loaded. And then, so you'll need to set that to whatever work order it was. Um, this one here is also important because when you make G code, when you come down and hit update or make new, this is the station it's gonna write code for. So if it's not what generated the nest, you're gonna get different results. So that is very important to watch. Um, and it does remember though, um, so you set it once, so you're, I'm always gonna use this one here. The next time you start it up, it will come in with that one. But until you set it at least once, it will just use, um, the first one on the list, and then that happen, mine happens to be default nest. Um, and so going down the list here, the first thing it comes up with is always the nesting tools. And I'll come back to the materials, but these buttons here are, most of them are, are the same. They are move and you got copy, you can erase parts and set the, the set and the location, change it. Um, this one here has changed a little bit. That's the rotate part. So if you want to rotate a part around, uh, you can do that. But it's only rotating one way. Before you hit rotate, and it, the part would just continue to, to go around. So now it only goes 0 and 90, so up and down. And the reason for that is we can control, or we know at that point if the part's been rotated. So when we're remaking the images, we know to rotate that part up or down based on what you've chosen. So that's, we can control it and we can figure out what the part is supposed to look like and we can get a, better, a good uh, estimate as far as what to show you on the label. If you uh, want to rotate more than that, yeah, you can use AutoCAD, but keep in mind then the, the image will probably not match. Um, so that is one of the changes. The machining tools, um, the, all these things here are the same. None of these have changed with the exception of the create new G code from drawing. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with that. Um, if you hit make new rather than come up with a dialog, which you've got to tell it where to put it and what to call it, it is automatically creates a new batch and just uses the same file or the same numbering sequence. So it'll be in this case here, I'm on batch one. So if I hit make new, it'll come up batch two and then use the number for that. Um, so those are, are these ones here. Back up to this one, to the materials. So let's say I want to add a new sheet. So add some new parts on it, or I want to copy some up, something. I don't want to cut all these again. I just want to cut the one. So this is your whole material list that's in your library. And you notice in this, this particular material, it has three sheet sizes. It's pulling in whatever's in the library. And I'm just going to draw this here. And it comes in preloaded with the material name and now you get an empty sheet. So now at this part, this time, rather I could either, I could either move some parts up there or I could come to the part tools and just start making some new ones. So I will go ahead and do that. Um, let's see here. And this is the border tool. So if you want to specify a different border tool, you can. It just comes in and it, all your available uh, router bits that are in your default nest, and in my case, will come in here. I'll just leave it uh, at that one. And now you get select existing or draw. So you could, if you wanted to, I could draw a polyline of any shape I wanted. I'll go ahead and do that. Yeah. 
so like that and that turns that into the part or if i want to draw a new one i just place it in there and it pasted it in there i messed that up so i'm just going to use autocad move in this instance to do that to move that guy down so now i got two new parts and now i can come back up to the nesting tools and i could update that in this case here it would always be new because there is no record of this in the work order um let me pause here for a second there's a couple questions coming in um So yeah, the current processing station doesn't always load to the correct station when opening a composite. It should, if you're having issues with that, you can let us know, but it always should when maintain that. Um, I'll just go ahead and test that really quick. So I got that one at what, to the 103 cutting nesting router and I come back open and it, it does that. So if that doesn't maintain, you have to let us know that I, uh, you would have to submit a support request. Uh, the next version, we are uh, uh, changing this a little bit. Stay tuned on what it all is. I don't have all the details yet, but it is going to change just a little bit. Um, the new composite drawing gets saved. It is going to be whatever first generated this. So in this case here, it was batch one. So if I save it, the composite will be saved in batch one, and we'll be making some changes to that as well. So if you make a new G code, it'll make a copy of the composite and store it in batch two if I made batch if I uh, went like this let's say now it's batch two and got some problems there so now I got batch two and it will save that inside your batch two directory so that's coming as well um, if we add a new part Okay, so we'll get back on that one later. Um, another thing that we have changed, this has been around a while, all these other tools, uh, the vertical, horizontal routing, none of these have really changed. Only thing that we have in them is this box here, only show tools with default depths. Before it would only appear in this list if you had default depth stored in the tool file. So now we just display everything in there in this list you no longer have to go back and do that we just display them all if you just want to see the previous list or only want to see there's too many here you can check that box and only tools with default depths will then be displayed so you can see here i only have one it's the four fly so that goes away that's the only change with these ones otherwise it behaves the exact same way as the 2d machine or the 2d part tools um, these are the same exact ones um, so at that point, yeah, you can move parts, you can add new ones in, you can draw whatever you want. Um, that's about it. Pretty basic tools there. Just the things to watch for again are, are these up here. Other than that, I think I am about done. Unless there's any more questions coming in. No, I think uh, I think that about does it, Shane. I think we covered covered that topic pretty thoroughly. Uh, and again, if you have additional questions on that part, uh, Shane will be hanging around, and you can chat with the, with him on those on your questions. All right. Have you uh, ever wondered um, when a change was made within your global variables, or maybe a system setting was altered? A lot of companies that we talk to have let us know that they needed some uh, help in this area to add a bit of user accountability. Uh, another uh, example is how many times have you actually started a proce uh, processing a project, walked away for whatever reason, only to return finding out that your project, project was interrupted uh, with an, a message of some sort. Uh, it can definitely be time consuming to babysit that UI sometimes um, when dealing with specific questions or, or messages that you have to answer or address. Well. Andrew is here to help us understand some of the key benefits of our new event logging and activity tracking. Yes, thank you so much, Clay. Yeah, so the event log and activity and tracking framework was implemented in the 15.6 release. And we did an overview of this feature in one of our past live events, so some of this might be review. Um, but there's been some questions about this feature coming through to support, and there's also been a couple of improvements that I want to share as well. 
And if you're unfamiliar with this feature, one of the main goals was to keep a record of all of the important changes that are made to your library and your projects. This keeps users accountable for the changes that they make and ensures an entire team can work together confidently by understanding exactly what changes are being made and by who. And so to give you a quick example of how this works here, if I open up my project specification groups and go into my global variable file, here we'll make a quick change. Uh, here we'll just go and change the back construction setting. So for our tile cabinets, we'll change from full captured to full applied. And so when I click OK, that's updated our project here. But you'll notice if I access my event log, I now have a new record in here. And so this is going to give me all the information. So here, if I open up this record, we can see that the project level global was modified. And here, this is a new feature. We've actually implemented the exact changes that were made. So here we can see that the tall back construction was modified and the original value was full captured and the new value is now full applied. And so this really gives you a lot of information as far as what changes are being made and also what user is making them. Now a couple quick things that we've improved um, in this interface from the first release that we had. Um, we noticed that the grid here that shows all of the events that have been happening were was taking a bit long to load and so we've done some optimizations to one load that a lot quicker and we've also implemented it to have a default filter so here on the left side it's going to automatically just show you the events that have happened within the last couple of days and so by having that automatically set up it just one immediately shows you what's been going on recently of course you can modify those filters if you want to look for a specific message you can just um, you know type that in and filter that out um, and if you're also unfamiliar, there's ways of sorting this information. So here, if I wanted to see the different event types, I can just drag this column into the header and that will sort the information, just giving you a lot more flexibility when it comes to um, displaying the events that you're working with here. And so um, another improvement that we've made is we limit what gets logged here. When we first released this feature, we pretty much went through the entire program and put an event track for everything that the user was doing. And it became a little overkill. So after we got some user feedback, we really wanted to make sure that it's just the important information that we're logging in here. And so that becomes really helpful. And so another goal of this whole feature was to speed up the workflow by allowing users to suppress message boxes that they didn't want to see. And so just so you can see, um, example of that, so here if I delete this product, here I can select that, select on my one door base. And here this is a standard message box just asking me if I wanted to erase this item. But we've given you the ability if you don't want to see these confirmation boxes, you can check this item and that will just speed up the workflow um, as far as how you do that. Now this was a common request that we received. Um, typically, we had this request as it relates to processing. So many of our customers like to process large jobs and might take 10, 15 minutes for it to process. So they would click the process button, they might go take a break, go help out in the shop, or just take a little bit of time off there. And they would come back hoping to find you know, the process had finished. But if it ran across any warning messages or any errors, maybe there was a test cabinet that you had in the job, it would stop the processing at that point and you would have to click OK for it to continue again. And so now what we've done is we have a way of just capturing all of those warnings or information while it's processing. So here, if we open up a work order really quick, so here's a work order that I've already processed and in the general tab, we have the view event log. And so this is gonna show us all of the events specifically for this work order. So you can see here, I've got some messages. It couldn't find a drill diameter. So this is you know good information, but I don't want it to stop the processing. Maybe that was just on a test cabinet that I had. And so I could still process the entire job and see everything um, when it came to what 
issues or warnings I need to know about within the event log. And so that's how that works um, within here. And with this feature, it you know really just kind of improves the general usage of the software, just kind of making it more pol polished and enjoyable to use. And Finally, the last thing that I want to show here is we got some questions coming into support. Now, if you had a message box and you chose to suppress that message box, you may want to, you know, have that message box come through again. And to enable those, if you go to the options page, here, if you have any hidden message boxes, you'll see this item. If this doesn't show, then it just means that there's no message boxes that you've suppressed. So here, if you click edit, this is gonna show all of the message boxes that I chose that I don't wanna see. And so if you wanna include those again, just go ahead and turn these back on, click okay, and those will come through. And so that's really everything that I wanted to go over when it came to the event log and activity tracking framework. So I'll go ahead and pass it back to you, Clay, and you can get into the fun stuff. All right. <clears throat> Thanks for that, Andrew. Definitely some great uh, tools there for users that want to keep track of changes made within the system and to definitely uh, suppress those, those messages as uh, they see the need. So thanks for that. All right, before we get started with our last part of the, of the day, I want to take just a minute and I'm going to launch a poll. Uh, I want to find out how many of you watching today either have currently machines equipped with, equipped with the auto labeling uh, features or plan on getting that. So in just a moment here, I'm going to launch that poll. There we go. So I'll leave that open for just a minute here while we get uh, transi transitioned into Dominic's part. Um, but this functionality has been becoming very popular, uh, we're finding. It basically removes the need to have a separate labeling station next to your CNC machine. Uh, where your operator has to place the labels on the parts manually. Instead, this uh, new method um, with machines that have this feature uh, allow you to print that label and attach the labels on the parts, uh, actually the sheet, before it's actually cut. Uh, so Dominic's here today to help us understand the science behind how we control uh, and how we uh, place those uh, labels on parts. All right, Clay. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, so it's interesting that I was going to ask everyone to, to uh, type in their chat window if they were using or interested in using auto nest labeling. So do me a favor when you get the results of that poll, uh, chat it on over to me so I can let everybody know. Yep, will do. All right, so uh, it's pretty obvious. Somebody had the genius idea of combining lime and Coke, which tasted terrible, but they marketed it as something really cool. Well, this is really cool. Being Somebody either put a printer right on the bridge of a CNC machine or right next to it with a little robot arm that's able to place those in pre-specified positions. So you're talking about gains in speed, accurate part identification, reduced labor, maybe even fewer reports to shop because your operator doesn't need to figure out what part is where to place the proper label. Plenty of advantages. So with microvellum, how do we interact with this? Well, previously, uh, we were flying blind. We did support auto nest labeling, but it would just land in the, the center of the bounding box of the part, and no one would really know how it was going to fall on that part until it was placed. And so this gave people very little control over the location. There could be collisions with an edge, depending on how the part was shaped, or maybe even collisions with machining, like drilling or routing right through it, and then your barcodes wouldn't work. Well, Microvellum, we are always happy to keep up with the latest that the industry has to offer. And you may have heard of our new integrated post processors, the platform that was built on and released with version 15.6 and a little bit earlier. But what those did was allow us more control and more intelligence to be able to deal with these auto nest labeling machines, which are quickly becoming standard. So. Uh, it's, I'm happy to introduce to everyone today Microvellum's new automatic nest labeling controls. So what we're going to do is take a look at a processing station. That's where they're controlled. And in a processing station that has a tool file that is what we call an IPP or integrated post processor that is equipped with auto nest labeling, there's a new tab here, labels. So there are just a few controls. It's always our goal to engineer the complexity out of any new 
feature that we produce that we make it as simple as possible for you to configure and use it. So with the automated placement, there's a type. So depending on your preferences, you could want a part placed on the lower, or the label automatically placed in the lower right area of a part, left, upper left, uh, maybe center of geometry, just so it's easy to identify. And then there's this center of gravity. So the reason we would do center of gravity is customers of ours and uh, users actually have robots that pick up robot arms that you've probably seen in shows that pick up the parts off of the nest bed. And if they don't pick it up in the correct spot, which is where the label is located, then the part will tip and fall off of the robot hand. So we actually calculate center of gravity for the part for the robot to know how to pick it up. Depending on the type of placement you choose, there are some options. How far away do you want it to be from the part border? How far away do you want it to be from any part machining? Do you want them displayed in the composite DWGs? And is your label placement mechanism actually capable of rotating labels? Some do, some don't. So we made that an option. So what I did was beforehand, I took the time to process a couple of batches. Uh, I tried to pick some of the oddest shaped parts I could get. That way you could see how well the algorithms work. So the idea is, on this one, you saw that I had uh, lower left selected. And so with this lower left, the algorithms chose to place these parts as close to the lower left as possible while avoiding machining. So you see, instead of actually colliding there, it would uh, place it appropriately. So that's lower left. Here's another example of dodging the machining so we wouldn't get a route right through it or maybe the label would be placed here or something. So they're able to detect that and, and uh, place them appropriately. Interestingly, uh, they also detect or this new, these new part controls detect the size of your label. So you don't have to do any additional configuration to your label. If you have a label selected for auto placement, the sizes that you specified for the printer are also read by Microvellum's automatic nest labeling controls and then placed appropriately. So here's an example of where I did center of gravity. I've always been interested once this was fully configured to see, okay, center of gravity, where actually is that on this part? And so some of these are perfectly placed for center of gravity. Some of them will deviate a little bit depending on how much tolerance you allow. So for instance, I allowed for a six inch uh, radius of tolerance for this to be placed. And if center of gravity was here, it'll circle out until it finds a, an area that it can place it. But if it's uh, able to be placed exactly at the center of gravity, like this here, uh, you're talking about less than one tenth of 1% deviation of weight. So it's gonna be perfectly balanced uh, depending on where the robot arm picks it up. I wanna show this to you though. If the label uh, is not able to be placed at center of gravity or within that radius, it will go ahead and just put it exactly at center of gravity and the operator will need to deal with it. That way, at least you have some label on the part, but it's gonna be pretty rare that you'll have something that will actually collide or anything, but it's not gonna hang off of the part. So uh, we hope that's gonna give a little bit more control. I wanted to show you an example of one that was automatically rotated here to be able to be placed completely on the part. You can see you did the same thing here. So a little bit more, uh, another step is that not only are you able to see the label placement beforehand in the composite DWG, but if you felt that you needed to alter the placement of it, you could do so. And just like with our center line or stay down algorithms that detect locations of the parts, we are also detecting the placement of the label and that will update into your G-code results and what you're actually gonna get on the machine. And you could also rotate as well, depending on if your machine is capable to any degree, 22 or that might be 44.2789. And uh, at that point, if your machine is capable, it'll actually place your label there. So I've been talking fast, but I haven't got to read any of the questions that we have. 
here. Clay, do we have any coming in that we might want to answer while we're here? Yeah, definitely. There's actually a lot on this topic coming in, so that's good. Um, we answered one of them for Ryan already live, and that was related to the moving, uh, rotating of those uh, those labels. So that one was good. We got that one covered. And Linda has got some other good ones in here. Uh, is it part of the new update that the labels are shown on the composite drawing? And so we haven't really talked about when and how somebody might get a hold of this version where this feature is included. Be happy to answer that. So uh, this feature was actually pushed up in priority for us because we have several people implementing very large uh, manufacturing configurations that contain robots and such, and we needed to support those earlier rather than later. So this has been shoehorned into 15.6. If you're interested in using this capability, you'll want to have a conversation with your account manager to help you determine whether you're using an IPP uh, and if your machine is configured properly, and then he'll help you out from there to get the appropriate update. And this uh, auto nest labeling placement is uh, something that comes coupled with auto labeling. So if you already have that, this you will just get this um, as part of an update. Let's see if there's any other questions here. Yep, there were some that was answered uh, via the, the text there. Uh, tech answered that for us. Um, but I think it was a good one from Linda again, because uh, I think we touched on it, but we didn't really dive into the detail. So are we ever, would we ever, using this the algorithm that it figures out where to place that label, place a label in between two parts or on top of machining? Is that is that uh, going to happen, or do we have a way to avoid that? So that's the the whole purpose of the algorithm is that it sees the machining on a part and dodges it. For instance, this was center of gravity here. And if you just did a quick cross section of this guy geometrically, you would see that the center of gravity is most likely going to be somewhere in this circle, maybe a little bit further this way. But because the machining was there, it detected that and it realized that it needed to move that out. And so from that area, I gave it a radius of six inches to be able to move out on. And it spiraled out from that center until it found a location that it could place the label without colliding with machining. So it's definitely part of this algorithm. Like I demonstrated earlier, only in a severe case where you have very limited uh, very limited area to place the part would you end up getting a label with collisions but that, i think that's going to be a very rare exception unless you're making small model airplanes <laughs> and have a six by six inch label mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that i wanted to let you know is that this label block right here will be shown on your nest as the exact same size as the label that you have specified. So right now I'm using a, I think I'm using a, a two by three or three by two or whatever the case is. But if you had a six by six or four by one or whatever the case is, this block will stretch accordingly and the placement algorithms will take that into consideration as well. Good. We, we had one other question uh, from, or oh, I have a bunch of still uh, outstanding that we're getting to, but uh, one that I'd like to highlight live is from Tyler um, from Eurowood. He wants to know if we can bypass labels on certain parts. Obviously, we, we can, uh, maybe we haven't talked about it, but deleting that label, what does that do? You know, if you were to delete that label that was right if there, I does that... delete this guy right here? Yep. Oh, I had both of those highlighted, actually. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I'll have to test it. Actually, we do this. Well, the question the question was more related to what if what if he's got a part that doesn't need a label? How does he deal with that? Right. So, for the automated placement, we'll have to look into that, uh, and I'd like to have a conversation with Tyler about that more later on. Good. Uh, how often would that happen? Um, and maybe why we're on the line here. If a few could even just type that in the chat, do you see it happening often that you would have a part without a label? If so, then we would find a way to flag parts that way. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, we would, if it's an, a rare occasion, then we would leave it up to somebody just to come in here and delete the block and then it would be produced without a label. Um, but I, there are other considerations that we would have to take into account and that is some machines, will not allow you to have a part 
without a label and they're because they're coupled together in the mapping files it's not anything that you would really want to do because the indexing would be off and you would get labels and wrong spots and things like that so it would take some research really um but uh you could just turn you could just have a processing station that has auto labeling off and then run those parts through that that would probably be the best approach right okay well I, there are quite a few more questions in here dominic i don't know if you want to take a look at some of those see which ones you might want to highlight uh we are uh, 10 minutes after um so yeah i think i think we're about wrapped up with this this part here unless there's any any of those that you want to highlight live there's some comments there related to your question about uh, parts you don't want to label from Dan. We don't label drawer parts, um, drawer box mm -hmm. parts. So some good okay. stuff coming in there. Yeah. So we'll probably come up with a recommended workflow for that after we. Right. Uh, with the uh, let's see. Another thing that uh, Linda brings up is that some of those printers have physical limitations. Uh, so we'll have to take a look at that. Yep. Sure. For sure, yeah. So this is just the first time that we've uh, unveiled this new functionality coming out, and I'm sure once our users get their hands on it, uh, we'll be taking a look at some ways that we can refine it even further. But definitely some great, uh, great new tools coming down the pipe here from uh, from development related to this uh, CNC auto labeling activity. So thanks for sharing on that, Dominic. Thanks for having me. All right, so if you are interested in learning anything or more about anything that we have discussed here today, please be sure to let us know. Uh, you can do that in by taking our performance poll that you should see now on your screen. Uh, let us know and we will definitely follow up with you. Um, so how many of you are digitally keeping track of your scrap material? Do you have a process in place to handle that? Uh, are you using our scrap man management tools now? Well, Dominic is coming back next week to talk to, with you about some of our new tools that we have for scrap management. And we're gonna look at our auto destruction controls. Uh, we're gonna talk about best practices. And we're even gonna hear from one of our customers in Nebraska, Tyler from Eurowood Cabinets will be joining us. And to register for that event, you can visit us at microbelm.com forward slash live where you'll be able to register for that uh, upcoming event there so we look forward to having Tyler on to talk about his uh, progress with implementing the scrap management system within his shop and hearing about his successes there so that'll about do it for today uh, I'd like to thank you once again thank you to all the presenters as well as to Grass America for uh, having David and Evelyn participate today and we will catch you next week on our next Microbelt live event